Now let me ask you a question. We just read two chapters of God basically writing letters to seven churches or speaking uh, seven messages to the angels of each of these seven churches. And you'll notice that the Spirit speaks to the church. And a lot of people believe that this is showing us that, you know, that's why there's something different when you come to church. When you come to church, it's different to just hearing a sermon online because this is where the Spirit of God is. So when the Spirit of God is here, God may have something to tell you through the sermon, but if you're not here, you may not get what God wants to tell you. And that's why I'd ask you, like, if God had a message for you, if God had something to say to you specifically, wouldn't you want to know what that was? You'd want to know what God has to say for you. And obviously we preach through his word, but what I'm getting, I'm not talking about like a Pentecostal revelation where it's like, hey, I'm getting a word from God. God told me this. What I'm saying is when you read God's word, sometimes God's word speaks to you in a different way and something illuminates in your mind. And the same happens at church where, you know, yeah, maybe you may listen to it. You say, oh, I'm, I'm, I, I don't need to be at church. I can just like listen to the sermon later. Or, it doesn't matter if I miss church. I can just hear the sermon later. No, because when you're in church and the Spirit of God is moving here, you may get something that you may not otherwise get if you're not in church. That's why today I want to encourage you to be in church, a reminder for us to prioritize church, to make sure that we are in church because, you know, you may ha get something in church from the Spirit of God that can change your life, but you may not have been there to hear it. That's what I'm saying. If God wanted to say something, if God had a special message for you, wouldn't you want to know what he had to say to you? But if you don't come to hear his word, you may miss what he has for you. And I'm not trying to speak myself up here. I'm not trying to say that, you know, I've got something so important to say that you have to be here. Because, you know, oftentimes, you know what's funny about preaching? Oftentimes you preach something and, and I'll preach something and I just think after, I was like, man, I, that didn't come out according to plan. Like, you know, I had my notes, you know, and I'm, I'm preaching the things that God had put on my heart. And, and sometimes it doesn't come across the way you want it to. And you, you, you finish your sermon and you're like, oh man, I, I hope somebody's moved by that. I hope somebody's edified by that. Or you're thinking, man, I did such, did such a terrible job. And oh, sometimes those sermons where you just think, oh, I don't know, I just bombed in that sermon. I just, my mind wasn't clear. I was struggling to find words. But people come up to you and say, you know what, I'm, I'm so glad you preached that on. And, and what is that? that? That's the Spirit of God. That's just, I'm just preaching the Word of God and sometimes the Word of God speaks to you in a way that I didn't even intend. And that's what you're going to miss out on if you're not here. And that's why you, you don't want to get this mindset that, yeah, well, if I just listen to the sermon later on, it's the same thing. No, it's not the same thing. Sometimes people don't listen to the sermons later on. Right? So there are some people that listen to the sermons later on and they'll get a bit of that teaching and they might have missed whatever God had for them if they had been in church. Some people don't listen to the sermons later on. And this is the preaching that you get when you get here and the preaching happens. And you know what happens as well? You know, when you come to church, you're here to listen and be exhorted and be encouraged. But you know when you're searching for sermons online, you, don't, you, don't, you generally don't look for those sermons. When you look for sermons online, you're looking for topics that you're interested in, you may browse over. If the title doesn't interest you, you may not listen to it. But you know when you're at church, you get it whether you like the title or not. Like if you see this title and you're scrolling through YouTube, and you're like, oh, being in church, yeah, I already know what Victor thinks about church. You may not listen to the sermon. But when you come to church, you know what? You hear the sermon, you hear the exhortation, you hear the rebuke, or you hear the encouragement, and you get what God has prepared for you today as the Spirit moves amongst us as I'm trying to preach the Word. So we need to make sure we're in church. Why? Because sometimes the Spirit speaks to the church and if you're not in church, you may miss it. And like I said, it's not just the words of the Bible. It's not just what I'm saying to you. It's how the Word of God speaks to you and enlightens you and gives you that understanding. And you know, Paul prayed for people. He prayed for people that they would see what he sees, that they would have spiritual eyes, that their eyes would be enlightened because it's more 
than just have a no, having a knowledge of what God's Word says. How many people know what God's Word says, but it doesn't necessarily speak to their heart and get them moving? Look at what it says here in Ephesians 1. It says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So look at what Paul is praying for. He's praying that the Ephesians would understand. See, not only know that he's preached words, know Paul, but understand like what God wants to tell them from his word. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Why? Why does he want God's word to speak to them, get a hold of their heart? That you may know what is the hope of his glory. And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is this, the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. See, see Paul, Paul prayed that people would see God in the same light that he saw God. And sometimes that's what will happen. You know, you know when you get to church, it might just click with you one day. You know, when the Spirit gets a hold of your heart and you think, what, well, you know what, I've got to do something different. I've got to change. You know, I've got to listen to this prompting. But you know when you're out of church, you're away from that. That's why when you're out of church, it's so easy to backslide. When you're out of church, you start getting back into your old habits. You start getting back into the world. You know, you, you're hanging out with your friends more than you're hanging out with the people of God. You hang, you're, you're listening to TV and listening to your movies more than you're hearing the preaching of God's Word. And you get away from the things of God and you start to realize, man, I'm backslidden. I'm not even thinking about the things of God. I'm not even reading my Bible anymore. I don't have a passion for the things of God anymore. You know, I'm starting to get more focused on my work. That's why church is so important. That's why you've got to be here. You've got to be here to be reminded, you know, get a bit of a kick in the behind, right? To get you moving again. That's why the Bible, Bible says in Ecclesiastes, the words of the wise are like goads and nails. Why? The, you know what a goad is? A goad is like a sharp stick that they would, you know, poke the animal to get them moving. And God's word is like that too. When you get here, the word of God is like a goad. It gets you moving in the right direction again. And what's a nail? You think of a nail that nails down into a tent. It keeps, stops things from moving, doesn't it? That's why the word of God not only gets you moving in the right direction, but it gives you some stability so that you know what you believe. You know where you stand. You're reminded of these things. So we have to be in church. Are you missing out? And what God has to say to you if you're not in church when we get together. So there's three things I want to talk about when you're being in church. First of all is you have to be present. You have to be here. To be here, first of all. all right, so be in church. We want, to, we, want, we want to be present in church. We actually want to have our butt in the seat at church listening amongst the people here because this is the body of Christ. It's the congregation of believers, right, as we get together. And you know what? You need church to grow in your spiritual life. Don't kid yourself that you're going to grow in your spiritual life without church. You know, I've had people say to me before, Victor, like, do I need to go to church to be spiritual? You know, they'll say things like, yeah, I can go to church. But, you know, Anybody, anybody that says, you know, do I need church to be spiritual? I'll show you that same person is probably not spiritual. You know, they're not, they're not prioritizing the things of God. They're not having God on their mind. They're not encouraging others to serve God. They're not, you know, they're probably not so, because I mean, because if you're a spiritual person, you're going to be serving God. You know where it happens? It happens in the local church where you're serving your brothers and sisters. If you were spiritual, you would want to go to church. So it's not, do you need to to go to church to be spiritual, a spiritual person wouldn't even say something like that. Right? So you can't be spiritual without church. You need church to grow. Just like a fire, the coals in a fire need to be together in order to be encouraged and to be motivated and to, to grow. The church works the same way. And you'll notice it in your own life when you've been away from church for a long time. I mean, we here at this church, we only meet once a week. So if you skip church once, you skip church twice, three times, man, you're going like a month already without being under the Word of God amongst God's people. We need to make sure we are present in church. You know, I've heard a saying where people say, well, how many times do I need to go to church? Whereas you, whereas you should think of it. You need to go to church 
You go to church until you want to go to church, and then you don't need to go to church anymore. <laughs> That's what people said. I heard people say, go to church until you want to go to church, and then you don't need to go to church anymore. But, you know, you show me someone that says they don't need to church to be spiritual, and I'll show you somebody that isn't spiritual. That's how it works. So what sort of mindset should we have when it comes to church, when it comes to being present in church? We shouldn't have the mindset of, do I have to go to church? We should have the mindset of, man, I get to go to church. You know, because we have a church here. We have the freedom to assemble. I think a lot of us are taking that for granted. We're taking it for granted that we have the freedom and the liberty to gather here, to preach God's word, to take the stands that we do without being persecuted. Other people don't always get this opportunity. You know, in other countries, other people, you know, where they may get persecuted, they may actually risk physical persecution for doing what we have the liberty to do here. And man, we take that for granted. And that's why oftentimes we talk about, you know, maybe what we need in Christianity in our Western civilization is a bit of persecution, real persecution, not just the ridicule. You know, when we talk about, when we talk about persecution, we're just like, oh, we don't want to feel awkward at work. Yeah. We don't want to feel awkward in our social circles. That's not the sort of persecution the Bible's talking about. The type of persecution the Bible talks about, it's like when you're striving under blood, like you have to risk your life sometimes. You have to go into hiding. And we do nothing of that. And we talk about how hard we have it as Christians, how hard it is to get to church, how hard it is to serve Jesus. Give me a break. We got it so easy. And I'm not trying to downplay people's struggles in their life, but really, compared to how much people have struggled in the past, guys, if we're real with ourselves, we've got it pretty easy. We've got it really easy. We live in prosperity. We don't have to worry about where food is. We don't have to worry about clothing. You know, we've got a nice air-conditioned building. You know, we take things so for granted. Man, that, those, sort of, those are the sort of things we, sh we should reflect on and drive us to want to praise God, to think, man, I want to be at God's house. I want to serve God. He's been so good to me. That's why the Bible says here in Psalm 122, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Is that your attitude about church? When you think about church, is it like, you get up on Sunday, oh man, got to go to church and put on my Sunday face. Hey brother, how you doing? You know? Is that your attitude when you come to church? You know, uh, you know for me, like this, this, is, this is where I want to be. You know, I look, for, I look forward to Sundays. I look forward to seeing you guys, you know, fellowshipping with you guys, serving with you guys. You know what I dread? I dread Mondays and going back to work. You know, so it should be the other way around, right? You shouldn't dread coming to church and look forward to going to work. It should be like, you know, dread, you know, having to live in this cursed world, right? When you come to church, you can have a bit of a release, you know, and go, be with people that you're not constantly, you know, butting heads with and whatnot. That's what we want to have at church. So that's why it's so important that we invest time with people at church Try and build the relationships here so that you have it's a pleasant experience. You know, because if you don't have friends here, you don't try and make friends here, you're not loving one another and being friendly with one another, it's not going to be what God intended it to be. And we want this place to be somewhere where people want to be here. You want to be glad when you come to the house of God. So you need to be present in church. But not only that, for yourself, that you need church to grow. I want you to think of this, do it for your kids. You know, like sometimes, you know, parents, they, they do things on Sundays, they get out of church, they don't prioritize church. And you just think like, man, if you don't do it for yourself, at least do it for the next generation. Do it to set that example. Do it for your kids. Because what are we teaching our kids when we don't prioritize the things of God? Like if you don't have God as a high priority in your life, what, what, are, you, what are your kids going to think when they grow up? Think about what the next generation will be like. When you think about how you live your life, is that how you want the next generation? What do you think of how the world is going now? Do you like how the world, the direction the world is going? Do you like how, how evil it's getting? What about the state of Christianity right now? Do you like the state of Christianity? The lukewarmness, the complacency, the things that they don't care about? 
They don't care about truth anymore. They don't care about what's, what's right and what's wrong. You know, homosexuality is allowed, adultery is allowed. You know, a statistic that I've heard is 60% of the people that have had abortions profess to be Christians. That's one of the statistics I've heard. Gosh, do you like the state of Christianity? Not just in the world and in America, but even in Australia. Do you like the lukewarmness of people when they talk about, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I mean, how often do they go to church? How often do they serve? Do they even care about the things of God? Well, you know what? If we do not take the things of God seriously, nothing is going to change. It's going to be the same. We're going to, we're going to look back, you know, 50 years from now, and we're going to have the same sort of society and we'll only have us to blame. Because the reason why society is the way it is now is because the generations before us didn't care about the things of God. And if you don't care about the things of God, then nothing's going to change. Man, I want to look back 50 years from now and look at the community we've built and think, oh man, a community that loves God, that, you know, godly older people that are serving God and setting the example. We want to look down at our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren that still believe the Bible, still know why they believe the Bible. Man, I don't want to grow up you know, 50 years from now and see all our children and grandchildren walk away from the faith. But you know what? If you don't take the things of God seriously, that's what's going to happen. Do you want that to happen? That's why you've got to take the things of God seriously, not just for yourself, not just for the next generation, but for the generation after that and the generation after that, because one day we're going to be the elders of society where we're like in our 70s, 80s, and 90s. And man, we should be setting the example. Setting the example for the next generation. Deuteronomy 4. Look here, we have a responsibility, not just for ourselves, but for our children, for our children's children. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them. Right? So it's not just about knowing what is right. It's about doing it as well. How many people do we know in older generations? Yeah, they know the right thing to do, but are they doing it? It's the same with you. You know the right thing to do, but are you doing it? You don't set an example. It's not a do as I say, not as I do. We have to tell our children to do as we do. And then we'll set the right example for the next generation. <laughs> Understanding in the sight of the nations, we shall hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. So what sort of community are we creating? What sort, of, what, sort of, what sort of story do we want to tell when we look back at our life? Do we want it to be the same? Do we want it to be worse? Or do we want to be able to look back and go, man, look at the community that we have. I mean, think about the community that you're in now. You know, maybe you're in a community of you know, uh, you know, your family and friends, your extended family and friends. What sort of community is that? And you think, man, I, you know, I wish it was more like this, I wish it was more like that. Well, just remember, the reason why it's like that is because those that went before us, that's what they've created. And if we want something different, we have to take ownership of the community that we're in and make a difference. And hopefully, when we look back, our children will thank us for the godly example, the godly doctrine that we've left them with, and the influence that we've had in shaping this community that we live in. So you have to be present in church, not just for yourself, but for your children. Number two is when you're in church, you want to be attentive, right? So be attentive in church. Look at Luke 10. Look at this story here. It's a familiar story. If it's not, I'll explain to you what happens here, but it's a quite an interesting story and in how Jesus reacts. Luke 10, 38. Now it came to pass as they went, 
that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister had left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. I just underline this, dost thou not care? Because, I mean, that really reveals the spiritual level of Martha right now. Because, <laughs> just think about it, right? <laughs> how, how can you say to Jesus that you don't care? How do you say to the God of the universe that, don't you care about me? It's like, you have no love. It's like, obviously she's not in a spiritual mindset here. And I just, I'm always uh, amazed when, you know, I read through this story to, to accuse Jesus of not caring. Dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, Thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. So isn't that interesting that there was a lot going on, you know, probably people in the house ready to hear Jesus preach, and there was a lot of things to do, but there came a time when Jesus was ready to speak. The teaching was going on. And Mary stopped to listen to what was being taught. Be attentive in church. Well, what did Martha do? Martha felt it was more important to go and do the service and all the things that were going on rather than stopping and being attentive during church. So I'm not saying that I'm standing here and I'm Jesus. But I'm saying like when the time, what I'm trying to draw from this story is there's a time to stop and be attentive to what is being taught at church, what is being preached. So don't just be present physically in church, but be present and attentive in church as well. So when the songs are singing, be attentive. Think about what the, the, the lyrics of the songs are meant to speak to you. If you don't know the songs, don't just come to church every week saying, oh, I don't know how to sing these songs. Learn the songs. Try and sing them. Sing along with them. When you sing the song, reflect on what the song is trying to teach you and reflect on the truths that it's teaching you. When the preaching is happening, are you listening? Are you listening to what is being taught? Are you thinking, you know, don't just say, you know, even, uh, you know, if it's familiar to you. Or even if, uh, you know, sometimes you think, oh, I've heard Victor preach on this before. There Victor goes again. The way, the mindset you should have when you come to church is, hey, when I'm listening to the preaching, what can I learn from this sermon? Even for people that you may not respect. You may, you know, sometimes people are in a church, they don't even respect the preacher. But you, if you don't respect them, or you, you don't like what they're saying, at least come and be ready to learn something. You know, see, what can I learn from this message? Take, if you don't like what I'm saying, take the meat and spit out the bones. But at least learn something. Be attentive so that you'll learn something. So that's why we want to be attentive. When the preaching is going on, guys, this is why I, I, I never like food preparation when the preaching is going on. You know, we should never be into that habit. That's why I always make sure we allow at church enough time for food preparation, enough time for lunch, because sometimes when churches have too tight of a schedule, you know what happens? Women, they want to come and they prepare things while preaching. They're like, oh, it's like, you know, it's okay. Like, you know, when the church is going on, I prepare because I want to have my stuff ready for, 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 for when people eat. No, that's this exact scenario. Martha, Martha, you're ca careful and troubled about many things. You know, there's one needful thing right now. You need to be there listening to the preaching. That's why I've always been against, you know, when people say, oh, I'll, I'll co you know, come during church, I'll just prepare things while the preaching is going on. No. Because no, no, not only is that not good for you, but that's not the example that we want to set. That it's okay to do things away when the preaching is going on. It's the same with your mobile phone. When the preaching is going on, it's not the time to check your mobile phone, scroll through your social media, check your emails. No, no, no. When, when the preaching is going on, you should be attentive. You need to listen to what's being preached and get the exhortation that has been prepared for you. It's the same with the singing, guys. With the singing. You should be here for the singing. Be here, learn the songs, sing the song, be blessed by the songs. 
Learn them. You will. You realize you'll be singing them throughout the week and the lyrics will bless you. Singing the songs is not the time. You know, go to the bathroom and do this and do that. Some people treat the songs like that. Like the songs is like the intermission. You know, where it's like they do the songs on, that's when they do things and they do that and do this. No. When, when, the, when the singing is happening, sing as well. Sing with the congregation. You're commanded to sing. Be attentive. One thing I want to mention as well, and I'm, I'm not upset at anyone in particular, but I just got to say this, right? If you skip, if you skip church, guys, any of you guys, don't, don't message in the church WhatsApp group. You know, if you're not at church, don't message in the WhatsApp group because you're going to send a message to everybody who's meant to be in church. And, you know, don't. So don't do things like that. If you're not in church, you know, and obviously we don't want to discourage people from not being in church, but if you, if you didn't come to church, don't message in the WhatsApp group. We don't, want to dis- we don't want to take people's attention away from church. You know, sometimes I've, I think I've, sometimes I've seen, like, church messages during church and then someone in church replying to that message or something like that. I'm just like, you're meant to be paying attention to me. You're not meant to be replying messages. So not only that, not only do you want to be attentive in church, but you want to start training your children to do the same as well. Right? So it's the same with your children. You want to be attentive in church. Don't come to church thinking, oh, my children don't pay attention anyway. I'll give them some games to play with, give them toys to play with, give them... You know, obviously with very young children, you've got to try and do what you can with very young children. But you want to start training your children to sit and listen as long as they can so they get into the habit of being attentive of church and listening to what is being preached. Teach your children, hey, there's a time to play and there's a time to listen. And when church is going on, that's not the time to play. That's the time to listen. So you want to start doing that as well as best as you can, training them to start to listen to what is being preached in church. All right, number three. Number three is not only do you want to be in church, present in church, you want to be attentive in church, but you want to be active in church as well. You need to get involved in the ministries. You know, you don't just come here every week, just listen, you know, help out. There's plenty of things to help out. You know, I really think I thank Katerina this morning, coming early, helping to set up uh, the Kids Bible Club. Um, you know, I, I really appreciate, just, just on a human level, I appreciate people that do. I, and I appreciate, you know, Gershon does a great job like packing up all the AV and stuff, and it just really, really helps out. But there's so many things to do at church that we want to do here. Get involved. You know, there's so many things to do, because, you know, the more helpers we have to make something happen, you know, the more things we can do at a, as a church. We can have other events. You know, and I, I won't be so worried about having an event, you know, and, and letting it out to the public, and then we can come and we can host an event. You know, if we have a host a movie night here, we could actually be the host and we can have everything organized. Because if we can't even run Sunday mornings, right, I mean, what hope do we have to run other events and larger events like that? So we want to be active in church. So not only be in church, be attentive in church, but be serving in church as well. Let's look at some verses there, James 1. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Now, don't be deceived in thinking just because you come to church, you hear the word, that you're spiritual. No, spiritual people are not hearers only, right? They are doers of the word. And you know what? If you don't do what you're taught, you're just going to forget what you're taught. And it's the same with the sermons. If you don't apply the sermon, you're going to forget what I taught you. I mean, how many times, how many sermons have you heard from me? How many do you remember? You know, who knows what I preached on last week? Who knows what I preached on the week before? You know, but whereas if you are attentive to the sermon and you think, you know what? I learned something this week. I'm going to apply it. You're going to retain the information. You're not going to be a forgetful hearer. So let's not deceive our own selves by just being hearers of the word and not doers only. So not only do we want to be a doer in the church, we want to be an edifier. We want to think about how we edify one another. What, is that, what does that mean to edify somebody else? How, do you, how are you encouraging somebody else to increase in their spiritual growth? You know, how are we encouraging others to get involved in the soul winning? Encouraging others to read their Bible? Encouraging others to think of the things of God and to think of the things, you know, how, you know, encouraging people to be in church. Right? That's one way. One way you encourage people to be in church is you're at church yourself. Because sometimes when you're at church, that encourages other people to go as well. 
when you're at church and there's more people here, aren't you more encouraged when you come to church and there's a bigger crowd rather than you come to church and it's just you and me? <laughs> you come to church on time and nobody's here. Are you encouraged? Are you encouraged by that? You think, man, I'm, that fires me up when I get to church at 10.01 and nobody's here. But when you come to church at 10 and everyone's here in their seats, ready, singing loud, I mean, that sort of stuff encourages you, doesn't it? So we want to be an edifier. Look at Ephesians 4. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies. Look at this, every joint. Every member in the church plays a part in edifying the church. Remember, we're a body, just like in the human body. Every part of the human body is there for a reason. You are in this church for a reason. What that reason is, I don't know. Are you the eye, the ear, the mouth, the heart, the lung, the knee? I don't know what part of this body you are, but you play a part in this body. And you know what? If you're not doing what you ought to be doing as a believer in this body, the whole body is not doing what it could be. God could be doing. You're holding the body back in some way or another. Who's ever stubbed their pinky toe? You don't realize you, you don't realize you need your pinky toe until it's missing. Right? Then, then when it's missing, you're like, man, that really helped me to walk. Well, church is the same. You know, sometimes a church, you know, and even so, like you can be taken for granted as a church member. Have I been taken for granted before? You probably sometimes feel like I take you for granted. I probably do. <laughs> Oftentimes I take people for granted because, you know, I'm human as well. You know, I, I appreciate everything that you guys do. You know, I, I probably don't say it enough. I, I just love the fact that you guys are even a, here, you know, being a part of this church. But you know what? And, you know, but when you're missing, something's missing in that church. And that's why when, you, when you're part of this church, you need to make sure you're here and be part. Every joint, every joint supplieth according to the effectual working and the measure of every part. Make it increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So we don't always want to only be a doer at church. You want to be an edifier as well. You want to think about, hey, how can I edify the body of Christ and help others grow in their spiritual life? And you know, one main way you've got to do it is by your own example. How you live affects the church as well. The next one is when you want to be active in church is you want to be a lover, not just a talker. What do I mean by that? First John 3, look at this. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. See, when we talk about loving one another, it's not just something we want to confess and just say, man, I love my brothers and sisters. You don't want to just confess, man, I'm praying for you. Right? Not just in word, but indeed. And you know what? In order to love somebody indeed, you've got to be here. You've got to know them, right? You've got to see them. That's why when people need help, man, that's, that's when we can step up and actually not just love in word, but in deed and in truth. So be a doer, an edifier, a lover. And the last one is we need to be a worker. We need to be a worker in the church, getting things done, getting involved in the soul winning, in the ministries that our church has. We want to get involved in those things so that we can make things happen. I was just at a festival yesterday and uh, the Hoxton Park Anglican Church was there. And I just thought, you know, obviously we don't agree with everything they believe, but you know what? It's, it's great to see when they have that stall there that there are a lot of people there, you know, giving out the bags and excited about trying to get people to their church. I mean, that sort of stuff's great. Maybe we'll do something like that one day. But we need people to work. We need to have workers that are willing to do that. Get out there and preach the gospel. Soul winning is a very practical way of being a worker in church. Every Sunday at 2.30 we meet here, you can get involved in the work, which is us going out and preaching the gospel door to door. Matthew 9, look what Jesus says here. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. What a sad statement there. 
that the harvest is plenteous. There's plenty of work out there to do, plenty of souls to be reaped and work to be done. So the limitation is not how many people are out there to save. The limitation is how many people are willing to work to get those people saved. That's the sad thing. And I've told you guys this before. I can only do so much as one person. That's why we need laborers. It's not just about throwing more money at it. Yeah, do we need money to make this outfit work? Can we do things with money? Of course we can. But you can only do so much with money. Why? Because there's only so much labor in that. You get to a point where you need laborers. And that's why the Bible says, Jesus says here, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. So just like Paul prayed in Ephesians, that your eyes of understanding would be enlightened. This is one thing I pray for you guys, that God will get a hold of your heart, that you'll have those spiritual eyes, that you'll see the world the way I hope you would see the world and that you would see and that God would send you forth into the harvest. You'd get involved in the work. Look what it says here in Ephesians 2. Now often we quote, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, you know, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Yes, salvation is not by works, but you know what? It says here, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God has works that he hath before ordained, that he's planned for you to do. So you know what? If you don't fulfill the works that God has for you to do, you're missing out. You're going to miss out on something. You're going to regret when you get to heaven the rewards that you missed out on, the souls that you could have got saved because you didn't do the work of God that he had before ordained, that you should walk in them. So do you ever think about that? Do you ever think about, man, what are you, what are you missing out on? You know, I think about just in a physical sense of finances, I always have this thought like, man, I wish I knew the things I knew now because then I could have been investing like a lot earlier on, right? At that time of saving that I don't have now. Well, you have that thought in finances, right? In the physical finances, don't you have, oh man, I wish I did done this. Well, don't make the same mistake with your spiritual finances. Don't make the same mistake when you get to heaven thinking, oh man, I wish I had invested more in heavenly things like you do with your physical finances. Right. The last one I want to talk about is, you know, hey, these are good reasons to be in church, right? Why you should be present in church, be attentive in church, be active in church. But ultimately, at the end of the day, end of the day, being in church is commanded of you. So it's not an option to be in church or not. You have to be in church as much as you can because it's a command of God not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. See, the manner of some is to forsake the assembling. And those are the people that you see week in, week out, not here, not caring that they're not here. These are the ones that are in sin, forsaking the assembly. You don't want to follow after their manner. You don't want to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. So ultimately, church should take priority because it's commanded of God. That's why you've got to, you've got to put it into your schedule. You ought not be waking up Sunday morning wondering whether you feel like going to church. Right, that should just You already know, hey, do you, what are you doing next Sunday? You already know what you're doing next Sunday. You're going to be in church next Sunday. What are you doing the Sunday after that? You're going to be in, you're going to be in church. You're not thinking like, well, you know what? I don't know what I'm going to be doing a Sunday a month from now. I haven't made plans yet. No, no, no. Make the plans today. Make the commitment today that you're going to be in church every week. Black it out of your schedule. Do the other stuff on other days of the week. You've got six other days of the week to do your things. There's one day of the week where we get together to worship God, to hear from God's word. Black that out of your calendar and make sure you're here. And then you don't have to wake up Sunday morning and wondering what you're doing on Sunday morning. You don't have to, you don't have to go to sleep Saturday night and think, oh, do I feel like going to church? You'll go because you've already made that decision. 
Anyways, I hope that sermon was a blessing, a good reminder to prioritize church. But I really encourage you guys, hey, make that commitment to prioritize church. Make that commitment to say, you know what? God has commanded me to be in church. I'm missing out on so much. I'm going to black out Sundays and make sure that I'm there, not just for my own sake, but for the sake of the next generation and the generation after that. Do these things. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Uh, thank you, Lord, for the exhortation and the rebuke. Um, sometimes we need it, Lord. Sometimes we need to be reminded what we are not doing. So I just pray, Lord, that you'd always help us in this church to prioritize your house, not only just to be present, but to be active, and not just for ourselves only, but also for the next generation. So, Lord, help us, because we're not perfect. Lord, I, you know, even in my own heart, I've dropped the ball. So I just pray, Lord, that you help us to have a passion. Help us to walk in the Spirit, because when we don't have the, des the right desires, it's because we're in the flesh. So help us, Lord. We need your grace to walk in the Spirit, to go on to greater things. And I pray, Lord, I do pray that in the future, 30, 40, 50 years from now, we'll look back and just see how much progress we've made. Look at the families that we've built, the communities that we've built. And Lord, I um, just pray that we'll be able to create that sort of environment for the third, fourth, and fifth generation after us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.